Now we have the time of confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. With that, may we all greet one another. May we be the people of prayer and evangelization. With that, the title for today is Jesus' Priority. Last week, as you saw in the news, in Panama, we held the evangelism conference for Central America and the dedication worship service for joining the RUTC in Panama. Latin America is truly far. I had to go to New York, wait five hours, and then go to San Francisco and wait six more hours, and then go on the plane again. And the course is very difficult, and I arrived at six in the morning. And I was praying today. And I thought how much Paul had went around. Going around the globe, it's about 40,000 kilometers. And I maybe went around a hundred times, but God protects me every day. And I'm so joyful giving worship here. Isn't it better than watching me through the screen? And seeing you, I'm not tired at all. I found immense joy in preparing to preach and meeting the congregation. There is no fatigue, for this pulpit brings overwhelming happiness. It is a gathering where believers holding on to the covenant of the three onlys, embarking on a covenantal challenge as we are heading towards one direction. Through this evangelism conference, a new chapter of challenges for the field in Central America has begun. Central America encompasses the regions of Central America, the Caribbean, the South America region, including all that. It's excluding the North American region of the United States and Canada. The continent of Central and South America constitutes a 15% of the world's land mass, making it the third largest after Asia and Africa. With a population of around 650 million people, it was formerly colonized by Spain and Portugal, leading to many nations using Spanish or Portuguese. Given the historical influence of Catholicism during the colonization, it is not an exaggeration to say that nearly every country is a Catholic nation. Combined with different religions, there is a mystical aspect of the faith, creating a sense of more of mysticism than the straightforward biblical faith. So going around the world, it's very difficult to find those who really believe. So how pitiful will God see it to be? It's not the biblical faith. It's all mixed together with different faiths. So that's why our footsteps are so important. The absolute partisan of Christ, the partisan that only speaks about Christ. This evangelism conference took place to establish the absolute partisan of Christ. The RUTC in Panama was officially established for this purpose. So many people had come and many people had donated for this. And Missionary Parg is there, and he was there for 37 years and listening to his testimony. He was sharing, and he said that he was meeting with the natives there. And he just went into 
the jungle. Ten, fifteen hours. There are no roads. He just went in. And he wasn't able to communicate, but he used his hands and feet because it's not Spanish that they use. They have a different language. But he continued to go in. I asked, how do they live in the jungle? And they said, they hunt and they eat together. And they don't even have schools. They can't even count. They only could count until number five. There are so many people groups like that. And he said he brought them out and preached the gospel, and now they have become pastors. And they were greeting me. And what's surprising is that he would walk 10 hours into the jungle. And they have become pastors, and now they have become established. They don't receive money. It's not that they have been self-established, but they said that they bring missions offering. Even if they don't have anything, they hunt a fish and they live farming. They eat one or two meals a day, but they bring offering. The true disciples who has the Gospels are like that. The first disciple established had greeted me. How the natives dress is completely different. So seeing that native be established, being a disciple, it really surprised me. Nine churches in Tegu would, for 40 days, train the missionaries. And they are so passionate. And there's a the pastor in Tegu who had said that it's been four months, uh, four weeks that he went into Central America because he has a passionate heart for Central America missions. He's the main pastor. The 777 prayer, it has to be detailedly explained because they cannot understand. And that's what we're doing right now. Even for the region of the Philippines, we must call the natives there. There was a building, and we went to the building, and it was a big restaurant, and it's that a hundred of the people from the jungle were there and receiving training. And I said, it's the first time that I've seen such a case. We have missionary Chung here, and he is going into the ministry of Pakistan, Malaysia, Singapore, and so on, and he's coming here right now. And you must be able to know that a committed and commissioned missionary is going around the world preaching the gospel. So you must know the purpose of why we are gathered here and why God established the church. Why do we have to make the church grow? It's so that we would gain our strength to do greater missions because there's so much that we need to do. So it's coming and I received a talk and he had established the RETC. And it's really astonishing. And he had said that the RU is now an official school that had been granted by the country. Kenya is of a completely different level. Of course, they're doing it right now, but they're going to 
preach the gospel to the 5,000 people groups, and it's all there. So all the committed and commissioned missionaries from our church are risking their lives and are preaching the gospel. Believers, please continue to constantly pray for the field in Central and South America. Those who have drawn specific countries in Central and South America are encouraged to pray with even more focus and tension. There's about 40 countries, so may be able to pray in Thanksgiving that you have picked that nation. So every week, it's in the church bulletin of the testimonies of the people who picked out the nation that every time I read, I'm so thankful. What are you interested in in your walk of faith? Why do you come to church? Indeed, our outcome of our walk of faith greatly depends on where our focus lies in. The life centered on worldly centered interest, self-centeredness, materialism, and worldly success as seen in Genesis chapter 3, 6, and 11 ultimately leads to the Tower of Babel. Those people who always say, money, 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 and say, we have to succeed. Those people who live with those standards. The non-believers, they're a different story because they are outside salvation, but those who are within salvation, it will be the Tower of Babel. Therefore, our focus should align with the three onlys in Acts 1, 1, 1, 3, and 1, 8. Only Christ, only the Kingdom of God, and only the life filled with the Holy Spirit. When living a life centered on only Christ, only Kingdom of God, and only the filling of the Holy Spirit, we become the main figures of the answer of the kingdom of God expanding. Why did Jesus come? Today's passage clearly illustrates why Jesus came to this earth and what specific interests he had pursued. Jesus concisely expressed his purpose in a single statement, to come and preach. He didn't beat around the bushes. Verse 8 reads, Let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Jesus' priority was always the gospel and evangelism. Evangelism is domestic and missions is international. His life exemplified the life-saving redeemer and evangelist. Where does your life have interest in? Is it evangelism, missions? Don't forcefully say amen to it, but have guilt. Where are you going all in into? You will know better. Therefore, for us as well, evangelism should not be a burden, but a blessing and the supreme focus of our lives. Many people feel burdened by the term evangelism itself. They say it's difficult, I cannot do it, and they feel burdened. However, this is being deceived as it is a misconception. Jesus made it clear in Acts 1.8 that evangelism is not something that you do, but something that naturally takes place. Those who cannot succeed in worship, evangelism cannot take place. Evangelism is not something that you do, but what takes place? You will not do the action of being witnesses, but you will become the witnesses. It's difficult if you try to do it. If you try to do something, it's difficult. It's tiring. I have to be the master. I have to do something. Of course, it's difficult. It is burdening. If you first enjoy the gospel, evangelism will naturally take place. It's the same thing as a pastor. If I enjoy being 
a pastor doing this ministry, then it will naturally take place. If that is not so, the church will go into suffering as well. There are many times that I know from the news that, oh, this is what our church is doing. It's the first time that I saw it as well. Saying, oh, they have very good ideas. There are so many things that I don't know. I don't know about the little details. Should I know of it? Evangelization, the walk of faith, it's something that all takes place. But the passage today, may all believers of Yohan Church clearly prioritize your own lives as Jesus has showed. You don't have to pray saying, give me health, make people acknowledge me. All you have to do is focus on Jesus' focus. Then, even if you don't ask for it, he will give it to you. You don't even have to ask, amen? So that's why I say that evangelization is a multi-blessing. But there are so many people who cannot believe in this. What is evangelization? It's a multi-blessing. I'm saying this by experience. In the situation where I don't have anything, I don't know evangelization. And there are many people who evangelize because they have experienced something and that they have been healed by an illness. But those who were Christian from birth, they don't really evangelize, but this is something amazing. May you be able to receive this multi-blessing. I am a witness. Is this just a sermon? No. I'm telling this out of experience. So do whatever you want, whether you do it or not, whether you believe it or not. I cannot say it enough. In the name of the Lord, I pray in all aspects of our lives that we may stand as witnesses living the life of the life-saving evangelist and possessing all the nations. Number one, Jesus who started in prayer. Verse 35. We could see that Jesus went to a quiet place to pray before dawn on the day after the Sabbath. If you look at today's scripture, we see that on the previous day, the Sabbath, Jesus had done many different things. He taught ministry in the synagogue at Capernaum, casted out an unclean spirit at the same place, and healed Peter's mother-in-law. Those who had heard this brought to him at nightfall who had various diseases and those who were possessed by demons, and he continued his ministry of healing. So he probably slept late, and he was on a very busy schedule. Yet according to today's scripture, he went to the place to communicate with God even before dawn. While we might humanly think that we are tired and that we need more sleep, we can see that Jesus was refreshed and renewed by prayer. And with that strength, he carried on his ministry. The Bible reveals that Jesus' characteristics of ministry are always done by prayer with his ministry. There was a prayer before he started his ministry. As a Savior, as Christ, as the Messiah, when he started, the first thing that he did was prayer. He fasted in front of God. God, may you give me new strength. In Luke 6, 12, we can see that before he chose the 12 disciples to be his apostles, he prayed to God all night long. He's a 100% man, a 100% God. So he has the weaknesses of man 
as well, so he has no choice but to pray. And just like in today's scripture, he began in prayer before all his ministries, even the night before his crucifixion. In Luke 22, 39, it reads, And he came out and went, as he as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives to pray. However, if you carefully observe the expression of the scripture, it says that Jesus followed a routine. It was not a separate time that he put aside for prayer but a special timetable for carrying the cross. As the time for carrying the cross was approaching. So I too went when I was in middle school with my mother. My mother always asked me to go to prayer with me. That's how God guided me. How can you pray in the military? You cannot, but God had guided me to do so all day long. So there was no one who prayed except for my mother and I at the church. So it was habitual. May you follow after me. May we make prayer a lifestyle. It must be a nature. 24-hour prayer. Not a word falls to the ground. as if it is recorded. You're praying to God, so how can that be gone? Even if you forget it, God will not forget it, and it is all fulfilled. It is not according to your will, but the will of God. So since I was young, upon the prayers of my mother, it is all fulfilled. It shows that prayer was the habitual to him. In other words, it was embedded in his daily life and had become part of his routine. The 24-hour prayer was in fact what had started from Jesus. The phrase, and he prayed in today's scripture, is very realistic. The word in the original text is proskito. It is in the imperfect tense, and in other words, it, signifi it signifies that Jesus did not slack in the discipline of prayer, and continu but continued to constantly pray. Even the divine Jesus prayed in this manner. Please follow after me. Prayer is the spiritual breath. If you cannot breathe, you die. Without prayer, that soul dies. Thus for us, it goes without saying. It is not a choice of whether you do it or not. Why is prayer called the breath of the souls? It is because prayer is not an optional choice for God's children, but a necessity. It shows if the person really prays or not. The words are different. Jesus himself showed us this exemplary model. The Bible shows us a unique expression to this kind of prayer. The expression is always. What does it say? Always. Luke 18.1 it, it's that Jesus uses a parable to illustrate the need to always pray and not lose heart. Luke 21, 26. Apostle Paul clearly reveals in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. 
그리스도 예수 안에서 너희를 향하여 하나님의 뜻이니라. It is completely revealed. It says that prayer is something that you should do all the time. It is about savoring the blessings of 24 hours of communication with God. Asking, what does this mean, Lord? Why is he saying this, Lord? Always call on to the name of the Lord. Lord, why am I like this? Pray. May you start with Lord. There is a writing about this. You should pray as you are doing your morning grooming. As if you would not go to work with a dirty face. Why would you want to start your day without washing your face of your soul? These are very meaningful words. This content gives us a spiritual challenge in our lives. Actually, many people spend a lot of time taking care of their appearance more for women than men. They have to do their mascaras. But people start their day without washing their souls. There are many people who start their day like this. When this happens, the direction of life becomes shaken. The choice is difficult. They live a life of confusion, not knowing what to do. Prayer takes a role in holding the center of gravity in our lives. I give you a testimony of when I start the day, I don't talk to anyone, I just pray. I say only the kingdom of God, only Jesus Christ, only the filling of the Holy Spirit. I say it five times and then I do my workout. And then I come down and I do the plank and go around the world because there are so many positions that I'm doing. I'm praying for all the people that I'm praying for. And then I kneel down and pray and then do my push-ups. I don't talk to anyone. What I see the f for the first time in the morning is the Word of God, the Bible. I pray to God, I read the Word of God, and then I eat and watch the news. I really keep that routine so that God would see. So may you do the walk of faith like a child, as if you believed in Jesus for the first time, whether you're a pastor, whether you're an elder, whether you are a born Christian, being like a child. It is walking the path and receiving the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the steps of the communication with God. Then your daily life would, would be inevitably changed. For those who feel burdened in the morning, I hope that you take time to communicate with God before going to bed, especially for the next day. Even when I go to the hair parlor, I say, God, may you be able to make it so that they would be able to do my hair well. Do you know what the filling of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit is? It's knowing the way in advance. It's 5-10 minutes in the morning, 5-10 minutes at night before you go to sleep, calling onto the Lord, the Father. And then during the day, it's continuous prayer. Upon all the meetings that you have, it is continuous prayer. For those who exercise, it's saying, Oh Lord, please make things go well. May you be able to pray. There is no other thing to do in the walk of faith. All you have to do is simply follow what Jesus showed and said. The gospel is very simple then you'll be able to experience the blessings that God has prepared for you. 
as the witnesses of all the nations. May all believers of you in church clearly prioritize prayer guided by the Holy Spirit. I bless you in the name of the Lord that you may walk the walk of faith every day as if you were soaring eagles. Two, Jesus, who went all in for evangelization. Verses 36 to 37. If we look at the content of the passage, it seems that while Jesus was away praying, many six people came to see Jesus early in the morning after hearing news about the healing ministry of Jesus that had taken place the previous day. So the disciples, including Peter, went out to look for Jesus and found him praying. They told Jesus that many people were looking for the Lord right now, so shouldn't he quickly go and meet them? However, Jesus answered irrelevantly to the requests of the disciples. Verses 38 to 39. Jesus reveals to his disciples the essential reason of why he came. The purpose of many people who came to Jesus, including the disciples, was to heal the sick and experience the miracles that Jesus performed. It was for them to be healed, to perform miracles, to solve my problems. However, the essential reason why Jesus came was to solve the fundamental problem of life that happened due to Genesis chapter 3. Because those illnesses and those problems, they're bound to come again. But the fundamental reason of Genesis chapter 3, due to the sin of the first man, Adam, all of mankind fell into sin and curses, being enslaved to Satan and being destined to eternal destruction. This is the fundamental problem of life. From this point on, the problems of birth, old age, illnesses, and death that make all mankind go into suffering and is currently experiencing has begun. However, as it is in today's text, many people do not try to solve the fundamental problem of Genesis chapter 3, but simply try to solve the visible diseases and various problems that are visible to the eyes. For example, it is money failures, problems. They say, please solve this and then we'll go to church. Yes, God will solve it. But if you keep on holding on to that and ask for it to be solved, the church is not a place for that. It is not for temporary solutions. It may seem like it may be getting better for a while, but in the end it is bound to get worse. Therefore, all mankind who have left God must meet God again. That way is by Jesus Christ. J Jesus Christ opened the way to recover by bearing the burden of all mankind's sin on the cross, becoming a sin offering and peace offering. Delivering this spiritual truth is precisely evangelism and is the essential reason Jesus came to this earth. The reason Jesus went to a quiet place early in the morning to pray was to establish and preach the gospel. Internationally, it is missions. Domestically, it is evangelization. What prayer do you think Jesus said? Was it to receive money? Was it for health? What do you think he prayed for? May you be able to mimic and follow Jesus' prayer. It is having an evangelism plan for that one soul. 
in communing with God, one thing happens. We enter into the gospel and save lives in the midst of prayer. Jesus gained new strength, and as stated in verse 39, he traveled throughout Galilee preaching the gospel, casting out demons, and expanding the kingdom of God. So I was praying all night long, asking for my child to be healed. But Jesus had said to pray, to evangelize. So I took out pickets that belonged to the middle schoolers, and we painted it, and we wrote scriptures about salvation, and I brought about 30 young adults out, and we evangelized. No one asked me to do it, but it was upon prayer. And then God solved everything. Jesus worked for the kingdom of God. Apostle Paul followed after the footsteps of Jesus. After receiving the call in the city of Damascus, he followed a lifelong mission of preaching the gospel. Led by the Holy Spirit, he embarked on journeys of evangelization in Asia Minor, Macedonia, and Rome. My wish is to die in the mission field, starting from when I established the church until now, not in the senior centers, but preaching the gospel in the mission field. That's my prayer topic. I even prayed when I went to Central America. Lord, may I be able to preach of the gospel in the mission field and go to you. Paul considered that the most precious thing in this life was testifying of the gospel of the grace of God with wholehearted dedication and perseverance as his covenantal challenge. When the time came to fulfill his mission, he passed the baton to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.2. We too must follow in the footsteps of Jesus and Evangelist Paul. This is why the church is establishing evangelism plans and is guiding you. This year's evangelism plan at Yeon Church was a Team of Three movement. In fact, the Team of Three movement will continue not only this year, but also into 2024. Let's say that the church is in this time schedule, but you're not interested, and I'm sorry to say that God is not interested in you as well. One third of the team of three groups have moved so far, so we'll continue into next year. Additionally, Flesh and blood evangelism referred to pe family and peer evangelization will be added through the expression. Though the expression may sound awkward, it encapsulates the heart of evangelism that Apostle Paul had. Because their family, it's difficult to evangelize because the parents don't listen to the children. Simply put, focusing on family evangelism includes the Start 10,000 movement, the 4,000 Bartism movement, and the 237 Healing movement. This is because the unbelieving family members and relatives are globally scattered. So I got married to my wife, but they were an unbelieving family. So they were very stiff-necked, being a very noble family. They would not say anything when I went. No one would say anything. We would only hear the sounds of spoons. 
So, in Christianity, everyone is loud when eating. And then my father-in-law asks, "Why are you talking so much while you're eating?" But then I asked, in anger, "When would we talk otherwise?" What the father-in-law had said was the law, but I was the only one who went against that. So my wife always prayed in tears for his salvation. I had a friend who was a very good talker. So we would evangelize together, and I said, "Can you please meet my elder? And can you evangelize to him?" May you make him come to acceptance, because my wife is going through such a difficult time that they do not believe in God. So may you be able to do it. So he went, and then they met at a Chinese restaurant, and he's. A very good evangelist. He's very good at speaking because we did bus evangelization together, and that father-in-law who was really strong-willed. Yes, it was really by the background of my wife's prayer, but. It's that he believed in Jesus Christ and accepted, and listening to that, I got goosebumps because I thought it was a hundred percent impossible, not ninety-nine percent. I thought that he was someone who would never believe in Jesus. But he was not the son-in-law, so it would be different. So he. Made that person come to acceptance, and he went from morning service, and they stopped ancestral worship. And it's been three years since that he believed in Jesus, but he wanted to write side notes for Rome. So they both passed away after being deacons. So from that start, all the family received the gospel. So if they don't believe, they will go to hell. So how can you leave them alone? I bless all Yemen Church believers a blessed journey in the new field of evangelism that will unfold in the year. 2024, as John, as Jesus said in John 15:16, bearing abundant fruit as Christ's absolute disciples. This is the conclusion. An article in a missions magazine read: Satan has a unique virtue, which is diligence that prohibits imitations. Satan tirelessly works twenty-four hours a day to make the church conform to the world, becoming a wounded giant devoid of power of salvation, and turn them into a silent giant. And having lost hold of the prophetic message, what does this mean? Satan is working with all his might to make the church lose its spiritual essence, especially by making God's children compromise with the world, rendering them to be powerless and turning their religious lives into silent obedience, working twenty-four hours to deceive. Then what should we do? 
Speak, amen. Just speak about the grace that you have received. Then you are not responsible anymore. You don't have to convince them to come to church. Proclaim the uniqueness of the gospel that Jesus is the Christ. Don't think about the result. It's not by your might or power. The answer to all of man's problems is Jesus Christ. Don't worry after that. We just need to speak and communicate that Jesus is the Christ to the people. And may be able to pray that their hearts will be the hearts of soil. So evangelization is not something that you do but what takes place. It is not something that can be done with our strength and abilities. It is done by the work of the Holy Spirit and evangelism will take place. I bless all you and believers in the name of the Lord to take action of the transformation and testify as the witnesses who follow Jesus who came to this earth for evangelization. Dear Father God, let us be the followers of Jesus who follows you to proclaim the gospel for evangelization. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.